Enjoy the not very cold weather while it lasts, because uh, um, yeah, sometimes it goes really bad. We don't have much snow in Toronto. Snow is not much, like, like, and it's very bad. It's like one foot or like two feet, something like that. Not. I never do. I don't know. I don't understand Fahrenheit. I don't. I don't. I don't do Fahrenheit. I don't. I don't know what it is. I, like I can't comprehend. But a half of my family are Americans, and when they, they talk temperature, I'm like, what the hell? I don't understand. Anyways, so enjoy it, and uh, uh, and uh, and um, let's uh, continue. So we talked about we talked about inheritance, and we we said you can you can build upon. Uh, for, uh, classes that you have already had and reuse their code to create new classes. And the syntax for it was as simple as um, creating, uh, so I'm just going to bring up uh, the, one of the latest things we have done. So we said when we have a base class and we want to inherit that base class into a, a new one, what we do, we write the name of the class call them public, and then the base class, and that, that brings everything that the original class has into the new one. And the new class that is building on the old class will have access to everything, everything that the base class has, directly or indirectly. When I say directly, I mean uh, public and protected stuff directly it can use. Private stuff, it can use using the public and protected stuff. So, so although it cannot access the private, uh, 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 what should we call it, uh, name over here or the, uh, the setting of the name or uh, something like that. So because uh, although it cannot access these, but it can use uh, uh, the rest of them to access the attributes that are private. So that's how the... Uh, the inheritance work. So everything, and we said that uh, in our stage and uh, understanding of inheritance, for now, we just inherit stuff publicly. So we say class cat public animal, which means uh, this public is going to be public. I'm not going to explain what protected or private inheritance is. Go Google it and try to find out what it is. We are not, I'm not going to confuse you. So this is all we do, all right? Then we talked about, when we talked about inheritance, we said that whenever you inherit out of a, a, a class, when the inheritance happens and it's final, using those classes, when you create a child class, a derived class, when you create a derived class, every single function that overrides the functions of the base class. What was overwrite? Do you remember? It, 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 it has exact same signature of the, of the base class and shadows the base class's uh, function. So essentially, uh, the child decides that that function of the parent is not good enough. I want, or it's not suitable for me, I want to change it to this. So it changes it. This override, unlike overload, has exact signature of the parent, and anything the child has will shadow what the parent has. So it's, it's the child's choice if it wants to use the parents, but if it doesn't, it completely covers that one. So when I create a cat and I tell to the cat to act, the act is identical to what the parent has. If the child implements the act, the act of the parent is completely forgotten and it's not going to be used. If it doesn't, let's say if mood is move is not implemented in cat, then automatically the parents will be used. Obviously, using the scope resolution in the child's in the child's implementation, these are all quick reviews, using the scope resolution and the name of the parent class, you can invoke the parent's methods inside any of the methods of the, of the child. So when I'm, when I'm in act, I could have called sound too. Sound doesn't have to be in sound sound. It just made sense that I say that the sound that I'm making with, for a cat is like a sound that animal makes but adds a meow to it, something like that, right? But, but uh, what I'm saying is that you could call this anywhere you want, 
All right? We mentioned that when you inherit from a base class, the base cl how the base class is, is instantiated is requested in the initialization area that is after the close parentheses of the constructor and open parentheses of uh, open curly bracket of the constructor. Anything you write over there, you want, you can, you can either initialize the current attributes of the derived class, or you can uh, request a specific constructor of the base class to be used to create the base part of the of the cat. So in the cat, I can say I want the animal to build to get built such and such. In this case, for example, in here when I create, if I create a default constructor, if I look at the animal, the animal uh, uh, doesn't have a default constructor. It has a default value that, uh, um, uh, because of the default value that it has, a no argument constructor is is available. Uh, so this acts like two constructors, one argument and uh, no argument. So in cat, in here, I am having a two argument constructor and I could say if the cat is defaulted, so I can actually do this. I can say cat and I put a default um, constructor for the cat and for the default constructor of the cat, I can say I want uh, animal has say, uh, we called it Garfield. So I want animal to be Garfield and I want uh, M number of lives to be nine. So now uh, using this default constructor, I am asking if they didn't mention how the cat is going to get created. Name it Garfield and give it num nine number of lights. I can decide how it's getting created. If you do not mention anything in here, however, it means your base class must have a default constructor. Otherwise, it cannot get created. So these were the things that we went through. So uh, back in here, then we talked about accessing the parent, uh, the child, using parent's reference and pointer. And we said, when you are creating a base class, an instance of a base class, there is no inheritance involved because the base class is created as a base class. I create an animal. That's it. When I create an animal, I don't know what's going to happen next. It could be a cat, dog. So animal is an animal. Everything acts like animal. I don't need to even think about inheritance. But when I create a cat, I can do it in many different ways. I can create a cat using a cat's handle, using a cat variable, using a cat reference. Doing something like that, again, everything is crystal clear, which means uh, a cat is going to act like a cat unless it doesn't implement the base classes methods. So everything is, again, is clear and straightforward. I don't need to. Uh, 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 worry about anything. The problem is when you create a child class, a derived class, and you keep or ref keep the address in a parent's pointer, or you refer to it using a parent's reference. It's as if you call someone by their last name instead of calling by their first name. In an object-oriented world, if you call somebody with their last name, they're going to behave like their parents. If you call them by their first name, they're going to behave like themselves. So I, the example is that if you call me Fardad, I'm going to teach C++. If you call me Mr. Solimandu, I'm going to teach you mechanics, because my dad taught me mechanics. OK, so you follow what I'm saying? So that's the problem. If that is your intention, then fine. If you want it to be that way, then sure, no problem. But if you do not want it that way, you want specific methods of the parent to always upgrade to the latest version depending on the inheritance. So if I have an animal and I say, animal, make a sound. If it's a cat, I want it to say, meow. If the animal is a dog, I want it to say, wolf. 
Okay? So when I say, when I create the object in the reference or pointer of an animal, when I want the animal make the sound, I want the compiler to check. Is inheritance involved? Is this pointer of animal pointing to an animal or is pointing to one of its children? If it's a child, I want the, the method of the child to be called. To do this, we can actually flag those, flag those functions to the compiler as a fake function, <laughs> as a function that's not the real one. It's the virtual one. Tell to the compiler here, this is not the main, this is not the real function. If there is a newer version, go in, call that one, not this one. And that happens using the virtual keyword. So when you add the virtual keyword to the beginning of any function, it guarantees that if, if a derived class is pointed by a base class or is referred to the base class, the child's method is called, not the parent's. So that normal case of that, what we said that, we said that when you are uh, calling a method, the method that is closer to the handle will be called. We said if you have a cat pointed by a cat, then the cat methods will be called. If you have a cat pointed by an animal, because the handle is animal, the functions that are closer to animal will be called, which, may, which are the animal methods. If we want to overwrite that and guarantee that always the latest methods are called, we call them virtual. We put a virtual at the beginning. Doing so, all the methods that are tagged as virtual will guarantee that the latest methods are called. So if I come to my main, in this case, For the first two, I don't even care if something is virtual or not because I have a cat in a cat pointer. I have a cat with a cat reference. I don't care. If an object, if an object is referred to by its own type, virtuality is out of the window. You don't even look for it. It's not in play. If anybody is called by their own name, by their own type, there is no virtuality. Virtuality only comes in effect when a derived class is pointed to by a base class or referred to by a base class. That's the only time that you should look for, check for uh, virtuals. This is the only time to check for virtuals. Okay? So, if that's the case, then if I actually use the animal reference and I say act, the cat's act will be called. If I go animal reference move, the animal will be called because move was not virtual. When I go animal sound, sound was virtual, the latest one will be called. So that's the rule. And I say the textbook answer to what virtuality does is virtuality guarantees that the latest version of a method is called. That's full stop. That's enough. But if you want to clarify it more, you can add to the end of that thing saying virtuality guarantees that the latest version of the method is called in hierarchy of inheritance. Okay? So you can add that little phrase at the end. But the first one will just answer the question, and we know what it is. So, <clears throat> because of this fact, yes, go ahead. Every single time, the derived function will be called, no matter how you do it. Virtuality guarantees that always the latest version is called no matter how you refer to the class. If you refer to the class with its own handle, with its own reference, then of course it's going to be called. But if you use any of the parents, parent, grandparent, grandparent, it doesn't matter. It's going to be called. And virtuality is transitive. So if I have an animal with a virtual function, then I have a pet after that, then I have a cat after that, then I have a lion after that. If I make the animal's function virtual, 
then cat will be virtual, a pet will be virtual, cat will be virtual, lion will be virtual. Which means if I have a lion pointed by a cat, still it's going to roar. If I have a lion pointed by a pet, a lion can be a pet. Ooh, that's exotic pet. But anyway, <laughs> they do? Oh my god. Anyway, so, so if I have a lion and it's, and, and it's pointed by a pet, still it's going to roar. If I have a lion it's pointed by an animal, it's still going to roar. It's a transitive thing. And in the children, I do not need to mention virtual. So the sound of an animal is virtual. The sound of a cat, I write it or not, it will be virtual. But it's always better to write so we can see it. Okay? But there is no need for it. It will be virtual. You have no choice on it. Okay? One more time. Latest means the one that is written later. The newest, what, the newest version. The latest version. No, 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 you can't. No, no. You're telling me we can first write the second story of the building and the, the forward declaration, it says it's only a class, no details. Remember, forward declaration tells to the compiler this is a class, and that's the only information it provides. It doesn't tell what methods it has. It doesn't say how it's being constructed. It doesn't say what kind of attribute it has. The only thing it says is that it's a class. That's why you can only use a pointer or a reference, not even a reference. Can you use a reference? Yeah, you can use a pointer or a reference. If you pass anything by value, it's not going to work because it needs to create it, and it doesn't have enough information for that. Forward declaration is only for references and pointers. Anyways, that was a separate thing, though. Anyway, so that's that. And we said, because of this fact, from now on, because of this fact, from now on, the signature of a destructor is changed. Any time you write a destructor, you must make it virtual. This guarantees there is no memory leak in any case of uh, uh, inheritance. So if I actually look at this main now, if the animal wasn't virtual, then this statement will cause memory leak because a cat is created in an animal pointer and is pointed by an animal pointer. There is no access to that cat as a cat. Therefore, deleting the animal pointer would have only deleted the animal part. But virtuality guarantees that the destructor of cat will be called. And because cat contains everything, everything's going to go away. OK, remember, cat has an animal in its belly. Are we good? OK. And that was called virtuality. Then, and I stop right here. So it comes to. Uh, what, what is the point of a virtual function? A virtual function is a function that can be upgraded. You can, you can modify, you can create new versions for it. Guarantee that always the new versions are created. But can we change the guarantee to enforcement? Can we enforce the children to create a method? Otherwise, the classes cannot be instantiated. Let's see if we can do that. Let's see if that happens in reality. Okay? So, we're going to start from here, and this is the example that I'm going to give. What is your mother tongue? Spanish. What is your mother tongue? Farsi. Farsi. What is your mother tongue? Funny? There is no Chinese language. Mandarin. Mandarin. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, if I say I, I speak Iranian, that, you know how many languages it cover? I, <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, Chinese. Okay, so, so we have Spanish, Farsi, Chinese, and Portuguese. Fantastic. Four this is called Canada, by the way. In one row, not two people talk the same language. And I speak Azerbaijanian. Okay, so that's it. So, so we go through these things, right? All right. So what happens is like this. So we are all human beings, right? And we are, 
I'm a robot. You don't know. I can, I'm impersonating. Yeah. I have chat GPT inside. You don't know. Anyway, so, so yeah. So we are all human beings. Okay. And we are also, we can be, and as you see, we can actually sit in an array of human beings, of five human beings. Okay? So first human, second human, third human, fourth human, and fifth human, right? If I say human number one, say, uh, say greetings, what do you say? If I tell you say greetings, what do you say? If I say greetings, what do you say? Ni hao. If I say greetings, what do you say? Bonjour? Isn't that French? Oh, my God. I thought that's French. But anyway, so as you see, greetings of these human beings are all in different ways, but they are actually doing it, right? So essentially, if I ask the first human being to talk, Spanish is going to come out. If I ask the second human being to talk, Farsi is going to come out. If I ask the third one, Chinese is going to come out, and so on and so forth. Do you understand that? Okay. Now, Let's go one step back. A human being can talk, correct? That's obvious. If I ask you to implement a human being, can you implement the talk function in it? How? Thank you. Do it. <laughs> it's just intuitive. Um, implement talking. What language it's going to be talking into? Ah, so see, you know human beings can talk, but you cannot implement it yet. You have to inherit a human being into a nationality, into a culture, language, into its gender to see if it's going to talk like this or it's going to talk like this, depending on that. All these, until you get to the latest version of that thing so you can implement a talk. Before that, all the talks are impossible. You don't have enough data to code the talking. Do we understand that? But a human being must be able to talk. That is what we call a pure virtual function. You create what we call an abstract base class. What is an abstract base class? A class that gives you all the information about what you need to know about that thing. But it's just an idea. It's not implementable. It's not creatable. If you are the best sculptor in the world, if you are Michelangelo itself, and I ask you to sculpt a human being, you can't. But you know what a human being is. You know all the basic things, head, eyes, nose, ears, everything. But as soon as I tell you do a sculpture, immediately you're going to tell me, is it a male or a female? Is it an athlete? Is it fat? Is it thin? Is it what do you, like you have to have all the specifications for it, correct? You cannot just sculpt a human being, although you know what a human being is. If I told you, if I told you that fuel this car, there's a car and I want you to fuel the car so the car can go. Can you do that? No, you don't know if it's a diesel car, you don't know if it's a gasoline car, electric car, you don't know. You don't know what fuels this car. So again, the car is, although if I told you a car, immediately it comes from the four wheel, steering wheel, the seats, everything comes to your mind, you know what a car looks like. But if I told you go to my kids, so you're going to tell me, oh, what is the car? What is the make of your car? What is the color of your car? I have to go right to the end. Do we understand? So how do we implement this in C++? In C++, when you have an idea and you want to enforce your idea so future programmers inherit the proper thing out of your class and they are forced to create that method, otherwise the class cannot be instantiated, you create a pure virtual method. A pure virtual method is like this. You see the sound? I'm saying an animal can make a sound. I don't know how. Equal to zero. So in the class definition, you put an equal zero in front of it, which means this is not going to have implementation. It's going to have only a prototype. 
And because of that fact, it renders the animal abstract, which means although I have a constructor in there, I have all the good stuff in there, I cannot instantiate it. I cannot say animal A something. It's going to tell me, you are trying to create an abstract-based class. This class is not complete. It has functions that are not implemented. I cannot create this class. But then I create a cat out of this class. Then I create a cat out of this class. And I make that sound thingy to happen. Now cat becomes a concrete class. A class that I can instantiate. And, uh, and then I create a dog class. And the dog class has its own sound. It's a concrete class. I can instantiate it. And when I look at the coding for it, it's as simple as this one says meow, and the other one says woof woof. Are you okay with this? Now, if I go to my main, I am going to use this exactly as I use the other ones, which means in my main, first of all, you cannot create an animal. If I, do, if I un uncomment this one, you'll see what happens. <clears throat> Let me set this thing to... I start a project. So <clears throat> if I actually come over here and do this, then it's going to tell me, hey, what the heck you're doing? You are creating an object of abstract class type, yada, yada, is not allowed. You cannot create an object out of a class that is incomplete. It has pure virtual functions. But then, I can create a dog. A dog implemented the sound of an animal. And I can create, <clears throat> say, four animals, animal pointers. I put a cat and a dog and a cat and another dog in there. So I have four animals, cat, dog, and cat, and a dog. Then I can put those in a loop, and I say, first animal, make a sound. Animal's pure virtual function doesn't have implementation, but its derived class cat has. Therefore, the latest version is called. Therefore, when this program is running, Really? When the program is running, the first one says meow, the second one says woof, third one meow, woof. So as you see, the latest one is called automatically. I don't need to worry about what is this animal. The animals will act like they should because animal has virtual functions in them. And when I delete them all, everything is deleted perfectly because the destructor is virtual. Therefore, when I delete one by one, it removes Jack the Cat, Dog, Jill, and it's not going to do anything for the last one because the last one wasn't dynamic. Yes? No, no, just for the sound. You may have different things created. Maybe I know how a human being dances. <laughs> I can implement that. But talking, I can't. Breathing, we all breathe identically, exactly the same way. So you can implement breathing for human beings. We all breathe the same way. It works the same way. Lungs work the same way. It gets the same red solid, broad cells, oxygen, and all the things that we have. So that is implementable. But there are things that are not. I'll come to your point in a second, though. There's a different thing. There's a cult. That's what you're saying class that only has pure virtual methods and nothing else. Don't criticize my design. I mean, like, you can, it's just an example. It's not a perfect thing. It actually sucks. But it's something that, it's something that we just learned from. If you think it's not right, then make it right. Have, Yes, of course. 
similar for example two of the animals that's my last example in my last example i have like fish and bird and everything so you'll see everything goes everywhere i'll show it to you okay so <clears throat> we're okay down to this point we're okay down to this point now i want to make his wish come through so sometimes 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 you have only an idea and nothing else sometimes you only have an idea and nothing else in those cases your class is nothing but an idea. You see that? My animal has no implementation whatsoever. And we can actually do this too over here. So <clears throat> this animal doesn't have any property, nothing. It has just series of pure virtual functions. Essentially, I'm saying when you create an animal, if that thing can act, move, and make a sound, it can be categorized as an animal. Go. So all the people who want to create animals, they're going to inherit from this. They can have many different things. If they have a fish, the fish can swim or float or whatever you call it. If they have a, a bird, the bird can fly. So they're going to have ex lots of extra stuff added to it. But all those must have an act and a move and a sound. Otherwise, they cannot exist. This type of thing in the, from the eyes of C++ has no difference with a class that has only one pure function. For, for abstract based classes. C doesn't care if you have everything as pure virtual or only one. For C, they are all the same. In object oriented terminology, however, these type of classes are called interfaces. So an interface is an abstract based class that only has pure virtual methods and nothing else. Are we good with that? So now, if you look at this one, the hierarchy over here looks like something like this. So as you see, I have an animal, then I have a pet, then I have a cat. So the hierarchy looks like something like this. Let's put it in here so we can see. Animal, out of an animal I have a pet, out of a pet I have a cat. And actually Visual C++ draws this for you. When you put the things, automatically shows the relationship for you. I'll, 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 uh, I'll clarify. Anyways, if I'll show you my code over here, you will see that animal is there. And then and after an animal, now I create a pet. And I'm going to say pet is an animal that has a name. Now it makes more sense. Animals don't have names, okay? You name them when, you, when they become your pet. And then you can do all the other stuff you want to do for a pet. Uh, so as you see over here, pet is uh, uh, implementing the move and a sound, but not acting. Okay, acting comes further. So pet is still an abstract-based class. Pet cannot get instantiated either because it did not implement the pure virtual function act. So it has something unimplemented. This is not a complete class. This is still an abstract based class. And then I create a cat out of this. And I, my cat could just ignore the move and a sound and only do the act. And it would have been a concrete class. Because the parent implemented the move and the act, uh, the move and the sound. So in here, for the class cat to be a concrete class, I needed to only implement the cat, the act. But I did the other ones too. 
and now I have an interface. And interfaces um, are used to literally, for what they mean, they are interface to use different things. So when you create an interface, so they are just tools to access what they are derived out of them. You put all the classes that are derived from the same interface in an array of that interface, and you can call them one by one, and all of them will do their own business because everything over there, every action of an interface is a virtual function, therefore always the latest versions are called. And that's what it is. You run this, you'll see. It, does, it doesn't make any difference. It works perfectly. And as you see, if I have a cat and I have the cat in an animal pointer or a pet pointer, it doesn't make any difference. It still acts like a cat because everything was pure virtual. So Now that we have gone that far, I'm going to bring something else in here. So after this, we have time just to practice on these. OK? So the, the days that you're coming, uh, I'm just going to play with these things in different ways so you can actually see how they work. And we're going to see how far we are in the class. So uh, actually, you know what? Uh, it's 10:56. Uh, Let's go for like five, six minutes, five, ten minutes uh, break and come back. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, bring you two more things so you have uh, uh, a, a broader understanding of how things happen. To kind of put everything in perspective, I created uh, this, which is uh, the animal, the pet, uh, a cat, goldfish, bird, and bird inherited into a body. So now, as you see, it's a much bigger type of, a, of inheritance uh, scheme. So when you look at the code over here, go through the code and see at home, go through the whole code and see exactly how each one is implemented. But what I want to show you is the main. So look at the main. It's exactly like the other one. I have an animal pointer, and I have a cat and a body and a goldfish in it. So three different things. And when you look at the hierarchy of inheritance over here, the distance between the death within a body and an animal is four levels of inheritance. So body is a bird that is a pet that is an animal. And the goldfish is a pet that is an animal. So it, it doesn't matter how deep the level of hierarchy goes, it always targets the last one. So now, if I do the act and the move and everything, then my cat and my body and everything will act exactly as how they're supposed to. The execution is obvious. So, Okay, so where is the output? Yes. Oops, I closed it. Okay, I'll open it again. Don't worry. Uh, it's 15 November 9th. This is the one, I think. Yeah, so let's go through it one more time. So yeah, as I was saying, these are all created. So it creates the, creates, as soon as I create the, the cat, the cat and a pet and an animals get created, everything gets created exactly how, how they are supposed to be in the level of their inheritance. So when I create a body, first, of course, animal is created, but because it's an interface, you don't see it. It doesn't have anything to show you in, that it's there, but it's there. So then the pet is there, the bird is there, the body is there. Everything gets created exactly how they are. And when I actually come over here and I say these animals are supposed to, uh, to act, when I say act, the act of the first one is going to be the cat, and the, 
the act of the second one is going to be a, a baji, and as you see, everything goes like that, and the last one is going to be a goldfish. So everything runs perfectly as they are supposed to, and when you delete them, everything gets deleted properly. And that explains exactly how interfaces work. In your project, you have something like that. You have something that is an interface for I.O., so input and output interface. So essentially a class that anybody inherits from there, they are capable of inputting and outputting. So you have pure virtual functions over there that force you to implement the input and output exactly as I want. Okay, and we're gonna continue from there. And uh, that's it, that's, uh, that's all about it. And uh, uh, for the, 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 this is the seventh one, I think. For the eighth one, uh, um, I am overloading C in and C out, so I'm the good thing about an interface is that you can overload stuff for an interface. So let me show you. The good thing about interface is this. So as I was saying, if you look at this one, although it is an interface, it's the same thing, but animal has a CPP part. Why? Let's take a look. This is my animal.h in here. <clears throat> and when you look at the animal, animal has act, move, and sound, and yada, yada, yada. Now I have a, an O stream overload for an animal. An animal that doesn't even exist. It's just an idea. So I'm saying if an animal is supposed to be inserted into O stream, this is how it's supposed to be. It should act, move, and make a sound, right? So I overloaded the insertion operator for an animal. Because every single class that I have over here is an animal, I don't need to overload them for them anymore. Any objects that you see over here will work perfectly for this and is displayable on, on, on O Street because I did it for the base interface. And that makes it beautiful. I don't have to rewrite it for every single one. I can print a, a goldfish, I can print a, a bhaji, I can print a, a, a cat, I can print a dog. Anything I can, I can print. Because they are all animal, it's gonna go into animal reference. And animal reference, we say act. Because it is an animal reference pointing to a fish, it will call the best function for the fish for acting automatically. And that makes it beautiful. You write one code for the base class, everything is covered for all of them. You're gonna do that in your project, okay? And when I run the program, you, when I show you the main, the main is now different like this. I don't need to, see I'm saying, print the target of the animal pointer. When I say print the target of the animal, the animal pointer has cat, body, and goldfish in it. But when I say print the target of the animal pointer, because I'm inserting it into C out, it goes to the overload of the animal, and automatically the latest version of everything is printed. Again, F10, F11 on this, go through it to understand how it works step by step. And just show it to you too, you'll see. So, so, <clears throat> uh, So when I come right down to here, these are all animal pointers. So one by one, it's going to get printed, as you see. But what I want to do is this. And they're all deleted. Now I have a cat that is Tom. You see that? So I'm saying C out C. There is no overload for cat to be inserted into C out. But there is one for its grandfather, which is an animal. So it's going to go to the animal. Now this A is an animal, but it's actually pointing to a cat. When I say act, the act of the cat is called because that's the latest version. When I go over here and I call move, the move of the cat is called because that's the latest version. And the sound of the cat, and we are done. So <clears throat> that's that. Okay? So, yeah, and I've written over here a test to show you the, all the things. So go through them step by step and see how they work. And the last one is exactly this one with messages for constructors so you see how things are built. So you can call that one and see how it. 
but everything. But that's it. That's the, that's the whole thing. And that brings us to, <coughs> brings us to here. <coughs> end of week nine, okay? So the only thing we have to, <clears throat> so essentially I have two more topics to go through for the semester that is important. The rest of them are just uh, uh, explanations and uh, input output, we have already done that. So you already know what they are. So we only need to talk about derived classes with the resource, that's a 10 minutes, 15 minutes lecture. So essentially when you're writing a copy constructor and copy assignment and you have inheritance, you should make sure that the parents are copied properly too. That's all. It's a very simple concept. Uh, and then function templates, that's it. And after this, we are also uh, only two topics to go through and the semester is over, all the things that we need to have. So it's going to be all review from now on. Any questions, anything you have, we're going to go through everything over and over right down to the, the, the test. Okay? That is going to be somewhere around